Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about SGD variants. So momentum, RMS prop, Atom, etc. So this video and notebook are based mostly on this paper over here, an overview of gradient descent optimization algorithms by Ruder from 2017. So we'll start with some theory and we'll start with a recap of what is stochastic gradient descent. So stochastic gradient descent is a simple update rule where in each step, we take the previous place where we were, the previous weights that we had, and we take a small step, so maybe 0 0.1, times the gradient in the current step. So the gradient in the current step is gives us the direction of steepest ascent, and then we take the opposite direction of that. That gives us, basically, we're making a step in the direction of the steepest descent. So why do we use SGD? Well, we don't have a closed form analytical solution. So if we had, we've just used it. The optimization problem is not convex. So we can't use more advanced convex methods. SGD only requires the gradient of the loss. So the first derivative, for this reason, it's a first order optimization technique. Higher order optimization techniques like Newton method, which requires the Hessian, the second derivative, are costly to compute. It's very hard to compute the Hessian for a very big neural network with lots of weights. There are also quasi-Newton methods, but they are also problematic for various reasons. So we are left with stochastic gradient descent, and it turns out it actually works pretty well for many problems. But that being said, there are variants that seem to improve on stochastic gradient descent. And so let's review them. But first, let me give you a big picture of what is the main idea of all these variants. So the main idea of all these variants is to move from a global learning rate. So we have this alpha here, and it's global. For all the Ws, it will be the same. To move to different or adaptive learning rates for each weight by itself. So each weight is kind of a dimension in the uh, loss surface. And we are trying to move in that surface by changing the weights in order that the loss will become as minimal as possible. But it could be that on certain dimensions, we should move faster or bigger, we should take bigger steps. And in certain dimensions, maybe we should take smaller steps. So the ideas behind all these variants that I'm going to talk about is to kind of try and use information that we have from the weights or from their gradients to adapt the step size that we take for that specific weight. Should we take a big step or should we take a small step? And so the first idea that we are going to talk about is called momentum. It's pretty old. It's from 1985, maybe even before. And there are two ways to write momentum mathematically. We'll start by the exponential moving average way, which is also the way that is presented in Adam. But then we will talk about the other way. The other way is actually why it's called momentum, because with EMA, we don't have a momentum. But let's look. So first, what is EMA? What is exponential moving average, also known as exponential smoothing? So what it is, it's this simple update rule where we have this moving average or this mean, or something that is closely related to a mean, and we keep updating it with new innovations, with new values. And we do it in a way where we always take this um, weighted average between the previous mean and the current new value. And so if we expand this, we'll get something like this. And notice that the past values, they decay exponentially. So every time you move a step forward, the previous steps, they are squeezed down by a factor of beta. And beta is between 0 and 1 and most often set to 0 0.9. So the past information decays exponentially, and this is why it's called exponential. And for momentum, we do this, but we do this with the gradient. So we look at the gradient, and we take an exponential moving average of it. So why does it work? Well, a picture is worth a thousand words, and this is the most uh, commonly used visualization. And we have here this loss surface in 2D, which looks like a ravine. And we see that if we start at a certain point, the steps that we'll take tends to oscillate in the vertical direction and not move fast enough in the horizontal direction. And so in this case, what will happen, the oscillation in the vertical axis will tend to 
cancel each other and we'll get smaller steps there. And in the horizontal direction, at least with the EMA formulation, we get that we are not slowing down on this axis. So this is what we will have using momentum. Now you might wonder, well, where's the momentum? I mean, momentum implies that there is some increased velocity in the horizontal dimension. But if we stick to the EMA definition, the maximal step we can arrive at is the original learning rate alpha. And so the term momentum really comes from the other definition of momentum, the original definition, which is like this. So in this definition, we define this moving average mu dash. So here, instead of multiplying by one minus beta times the X, and then multiplying everything by alpha, I'm just multiplying the innovation by alpha, alpha dash here. And then I'm just taking a step in the opposite direction of this. Now, this is mathematically equivalent to EMA, only it scales the learning rate. So let's see that. Let's start with this and see how we move from this to the EMA definition. Okay, so let's get from this definition to the EMA definition. We'll start from this. We'll take alpha dash out. We'll get this. Now I want to denote alpha dash divided by one minus beta by alpha. I plug it in, I get this thing over here. I'll divide by alpha and I'll denote mu dash divided by alpha as mu. I'll plug it in, I'll get mu here and mu here. Then I'll multiply this to get this and here we have the EMA definition from before. So we see that the two definitions are actually identical. Only mu dash is equal to alpha times mu and alpha dash is equal to alpha times y and minus beta. So put in other words, using the paper definition, we start with alpha dash, which is smaller than the alpha that we could use in EMA. And then we can grow all the way up to alpha. And this is the momentum. So we start with a smaller learning rate or whatever learning rate we start with, we can grow up to a learning rate of that learning rate divided by one minus beta. And again, one minus beta, if beta is 0 0.9, it's, 0.1, and so we can grow up to 10 times as much as that learning rate. And this is where we can gain momentum. So that was momentum. Another SGD variant is called Nestrov Accelerated Gradient, or NAG. And if momentum is somewhat analogous to a ball going down the hill, there is a danger of overshooting the targets or the minima. So we would want maybe that our ball would be a bit smarter and be able to pick into the future and see if it has to break and maybe change the direction. So this is exactly what NAG does. It's almost identical to momentum, only it, instead of taking the gradient of the current parameters, it calculates the gradient of the parameters after a pure step in the direction of the momentum. And by pure, I mean, we just take a step in the direction of the momentum. So this is, let's call it, a part of the momentum, or this is the moving average, and we take a small step towards that direction, and we take the gradient here. So in regular momentum, this is how regular momentum looks like with the paper definition, not the EMA definition. In NAG, it's exactly the same, only instead of taking the gradient here, we are taking the gradient of this W pure. So after we took a step in the direction of the momentum, we take a step in the direction of momentum, calculate the gradient there, and then use that for the updates of momentum. Okay, so this is the difference between momentum and nag. So this is one idea. There's also a group of ideas that deal with dividing the gradient with the second moment of the gradient. So one of these ideas is called adagrad, and what it does, it accumulates the sum of squares of the gradient, so basically the second moment. Uh, of the gradients, it accumulates them. And then it divides the actual gradient by the square root of this accumulation. Okay, and for numerical reason, we add a small epsilon to the denominator. And sometimes you will see that the epsilon is added to the square root. Sometimes it's outside of the square root. It doesn't really matter, but the implementation usually tries to stick to the actual paper uh, that used it. So this also adapts the global learning rate to be more locally, because if the gradients in, for a certain weight were small, 
in magnitude, taking their squares will also be small, and then taking their square root of that will also be small. So we divide by a small number and we say basically we want it to either grow if the small number is a fraction or shrink but not shrink as much. Whereas if the gradients in magnitudes were really big, the squares will be big, the sum will be big, the square root will be big, and then we are shrinking down the step for these weights and we tell the algorithm to slow down. Maybe we think there's oscillation. Maybe we are moving too fast. We tell it to slow down. Now, maybe some of you see a problem here. The problem is that this accumulation is infinite. So the further we continue with the optimization, with the learning, these Vs will just grow bigger and bigger. And so the steps that we'll take will become smaller and smaller until they eventually halt. So eventually we won't take any noticeable steps at all. And so there are two other algorithms that try to deal with it. One is called RMS prop. It's based on unpublished work by Tillman and is popularized by slides from a university lecture given by Jeffrey Hinton. And what it does, it replaces the unbounded sum with an exponential moving average, an EMA, of these second moments. So if before we just accumulated these uh, gradients squared, here we do an exponential moving average. So now it's bounded. Now it's basically just the expected value of the gradient squared. And here we won't have this problem anymore. Now note that V here can be thought of as the mean of the gradient squared. It's an exponential moving average, but it's more or less the mean. Uh, the mean of g squared is equal to the variance of g plus the mean of g squared. And if the gradients are more or less the same, so think maybe a meadow or going just in the same direction in the same speed, this variance term should be very small. And so this whole thing should be more or less equal to this. And then dividing by the square root of this and taking a learning step in that direction, it's equal to this. So g divided by the mean, it's more or less should be 1 or minus 1, depending on the direction. So this is more or less the magnitude of the steps is alpha. But if the gradients are changing a lot, for example, oscillation, as in the ravine example from above, or a sharp fall, maybe we, are, maybe we fell into a cliff, then v here will be very big, and we will slow down. Another algorithm is called ADA delta. I have a bit of a mixed feelings about this algorithm. I'm not sure I understand the logic behind it. The way I understand it is it tries to approximate the Newton method. So what is the Newton method? The Newton method, the update rule, is you take the gradient and you multiply it uh, with the inverse of the Hessian. And again, the inverse of the Hessian is usually too difficult to compute. Let's assume a diagonal action, and then we will get this thing over here. Now W, think of it as all of the weight matrices pulled together into a giant vector. And then we are looking now at a specific element in that vector. So a specific weight corresponding to some weight in some matrix or in some bias term. Because the Hessian is now diagonal, we get that it's just equal to this. This is still maybe hard to compute. So maybe we can change the equation and divide by this to get this equality over here. And so what Ada Delta, as I understand, tries to do it says, OK, we can't compute this. Let's try to approximate the numerator and the denominator and then divide them to get this. And how does it calculate the numerator and the denominator? For some reason, it uses the root mean squared of these steps and of the gradients. And uh, yeah, and this is how it does it. And then this is more or less the inverse second derivative, we then multiply it by g to get the actual update rule. We start with these terms equal to 0. And the reason this algorithm doesn't get stuck is because we add the epsilon, which basically kickstarts the values. And notice that here we also don't need a learning rate parameter, an alpha, because we just don't have it anywhere in the equations. So my biggest beef with this algorithm is that I think this equality only holds if the actual steps that we are taking here are due to Newton's method. So I think we are kind of mixing cause and effects here because this equality is only true if we actually update using new Newton's method. If, if we update using something else, 
this equality isn't true and we are not getting an approximation of the Hessian. We might be getting something else, which is good, but it's not an approximation of the Hessian. I also made a small experiment where I had a diagonal Hessian, which was known, and I tried to see if using this method gave anything that was close to one over the Hessian, and it didn't. So this is my main concern with this explanation or theory behind this method. Another thing is I don't really understand why we are using the RMS here and not, I don't know, the mean, but that's secondary to this biggest concern here, which I just don't think this makes sense, at least not to me, but could be that I'm totally wrong. If you think I'm wrong, please leave a comment and explain to me how. And nonetheless, it is a popular method and it's implemented both in PyTorch and in Keras. So maybe it's useful to know about. Okay, now it's time to move to the crown jewel, the ADAM method. ADAM stands for Adaptive Moment Estimation, but what it really does is a combination of both momentum in the EMA formulation and RMS prop. So it combines both of them and then it adds a little bias correction to both of them. So we have the gradient, it's G, momentum with the EMA formulation is just this, RMS prop is just this over here. Then we correct for the bias. We divide the momentum by this term over here, one minus beta one to the power of T, if we are in time step T. We do the same for the RMS term. And finally, we take these terms and we update the weights like this. So it makes sense. Momentum works. We adapt the learning step according to some rule. RMS prop works, we adapt the learning step according to that rule, maybe we join forces here and we update according to both rules. So this is what uh, we do. And it turns out that it works really well. It's really one of the most famous optimization algorithms. It's really one of the most popular SGD variants used in neural networks. Now, what is this bias correction? Well, if we calculate the mean of this running average that we use, yeah, if either for the momentum or for the RMS. Once we open this, we get this at time step t, as I've shown above. And then if we assume that the g's uh, are all coming from the same distribution, it's not a very valid assumption, but, but locally it is. For a certain uh, area in the loss surface, it makes sense. And because we are using EMA, it also kind of makes sense in the global sense, because Gs that are not in our local area, they are discounted uh, significantly by these parameters beta. Okay, so if we assume that, we can take out the Gs outside, and then it's just the expected value of the G times this term over here. This is a geometric sum. It's equal to this. This and this divided, and we get this. Now, this is a bias term. What we really want, we want this thing. So let's divide by this to get the unbiased term, this term. And the derivation for V for the RMS term is analogous. Okay, in the same paper, they also give another algorithm which is called Adamax. So this is a generalization of Adam and it looks at the V term as if it's an L2 norm of the vector of all the past decade second moments, right? So this is the V term. Notice that it's equal to this. If we put P uh, equal to, then this is equal. And here we just change beta with beta squared. It doesn't matter. So whatever my beta was, I can take a square root of that and then uh, take it to be to the power of two. Yeah. And so if we do that, if we take P equal two, we just get the RMS update from before, but we can change it from taking P equal two to taking whatever P that we want. And then this is equal to this. So one way to look at it is it's as if we have a vector of size t and we're just taking each element of that, squaring that, and then taking the square root of it. So now instead of two, we will use a general p. We get this. And let's look at this one over p. So not the square root, but the p root of this thing. And let's take p to infinity. So we have this term over here. Let's take this outside, we will have this. Let's take P here and P here outside and we will have this. 
this, if we take the limit as p grows to infinity, this goes to one, we are left with this. And here, as we take p to infinity, the only thing that will actually contribute anything is the maximum to, of all the elements in this sum or this vector. And so it's actually equal to the max between all these elements. And instead of keeping all the previous gradients, there's actually a simple recursive formula where we can just take the maximum between the previous term and the current term. So the previous term times the beta 2 and the current term. And so this is what we will do when we implement it. And no bias correction is needed for the u, but for the mean, for the mu, we still it stays the same, so we still have to do bias correction. The final algorithm I want to talk about is NADAM. So basically, it's the incorporation of NAG into ADAM, only it's not really using NAG, the original version. It uses some other version of NAG. So this is the version it uses. And if g is the gradient, we take mu to be this. So we are not using the pure gradient as before. We are taking the regular gradient. Now, instead of just subtracting this, we will subtract this, but use the current mean. So not mu t minus one, but mu t, okay? So this is the difference between momentum and this modified nag. In momentum, we have this. With this modified nag, we have this. So we don't peak with the gradient, we peak with the momentum term. So we take mu t instead of mu t minus one. So this is the modified nag. And now we are going to apply this to Adam. So we are going to apply it only to the mu. The v terms stays the same. This is the mu. Then we bias correct it. And then we take this step. So we plug this into here. We get this thing. And then we plug this into this. We get this thing. Here I separated the sum. And we got this. And now exactly in the same principle, instead of using the previous mean, we are going to peek ahead and use the current mean and also adjust the bias term. Yeah, and so this is how the paper incorporates this modified NAG version into the Adam algorithm. So this was the theoretic part. Now let's move to the empirical part.